Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa barakatuh. In the name of Allah, I may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his last and final messenger. As to what follows, family, friends, foes, haters, and hate at, welcome back to the features. I welcome you all with peace and love and no hatred in my heart. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon all of you. And as usual, I will humbly ask you to support your grassroots black Muslim media by doing the hitchhike. Doing the hitchhike. Get those thumbs up. Subscribe. Share. And don't forget to hit me up on Patreon. As you know, we got a lot of haters up in here. And this particular episode is going to be a bit of a roller coaster, as usual, anyways. But so before I get into it, I have to read the copyright disclaimer because you know how people like to censor my videos. So we got to follow the rules. So copyright disclaimer under the section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing nonprofit educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use so in our last video I said that some of our Muslim elite have taken a favorable stance towards the vaccinations and one of the Muslim elite is dr. Yasser Qadi so let's see what he has to say so i mean again without getting too technical but explain to us lay people like if the va if the vaccine does not contain the virus well then what is in it so actually it's uh it's pretty amazing that uh, this vaccine has literally five ingredients in it it has the mrna molecules it has a lipid carrier which helps that mrna get into our cells um, so basically fat cells um, saline potassium and sugar. Those are the five ingredients that are in this vaccine. There is no preservatives, no heavy metals, no mercury, no aluminum. None of the stuff that they had to put in previous conventional vaccines is present in these new generation mRNA vaccines. So that is, should be a sigh of relief for a lot of us uh, that worry about those kind of things. So that was just a clip with uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi and his guest, uh, Brother Dr. Abawi. Cause, and the name of the lecture was the COVID vaccine between fake and medicine, and it's episode 143. So I just wanted to basically show you that, you know, he's essentially telling the ingredients that's in the vaccine, right? So what is Dr. Yasser Qadi's stance concerning the vaccine? Obviously, we know that he's pro-vaccination, but how hardline is his stance? Let's have a look. So Dr. Yasser Qadi wrote in a post on Facebook, we currently have a global pandemic raging, devastating lives and disrupting every aspect of society. Now that there is a potential for a vaccine, let the specialists speak about its pros and cons and don't jump on any populist bandwagon. Realize that if you forward nonsensical videos and relay incorrect information that potentially causes someone else to do something that is harmful, for example, do not take the vaccine that is effective, you might be liable for any harm caused. And at the end, he puts a disclaimer. Note, this is not a blanket endorsement of the vaccine. Rather, it is a call to act responsibly and let qualified, trained, recognized specialists lead the way to endorse or criticize aspects of the vaccine. Also, uh, we have Mufti Mink, who had taken the vaccine and he got a sticker, you know, I got vaccinated or whatever, and it went viral, I guess. People started making noise about it. But anyway, let's see what he had to say about it. Yesterday, there was a picture of me uh, getting the Sinopharm vaccine. And uh, 
there were a lot of comments and a lot of people had a lot to say. Number one, I did not tell anyone to take the vaccine and I did not tell anyone not to take the vaccine. I simply showed myself taking the vaccine. Now, there are so many uh, news outlets out there, so much happening, so much that is said. One would expect that people would read thoroughly, not from any source. You can't just pick up something from uh, the social media and start believing things. You know, so many people died because of this. People became zombies. People started learning Chinese or they knew Chinese simply as a result of them having been vaccinated. Uh, people, uh, they, they became this and that. There is a lot of fake news out there, to be very honest. There are so many people cracking jokes uh, in a realistic way, such that uh, in, a, in a way that it seems real. And people think that this is actually the reality. Now, People were asking me, why did you do that? You know, isn't it haram? My brother, my sister, I am not pro being vaccinated for nothing, not at all. And I am a person who would study, check deeply, read, consult, and having access to a cross section of people, talk to them and see how best things can work and so on, and make sure that you lead by proper example. And I don't give a damn what people have to say after that about me. So these two brothers from your Muslim elite, Dr. Yasser Qadi and Mufti Mink, even though they preface their arguments with disclaimers saying that they are not blanketly promoting vaccinations, it's safe to say that they're pro-vaccine based on the context of their own words and their own writings and their own actions, actually, <laughs> right? So we can, we can deduce that. Right, and they're pretty hardline pro vaccine. However, I'm not making this video, first of all, to I want, I don't want, I want to make this very clear. I'm not making this video to embarrass uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi or Mufti Mank or Dr. Yasser Qadi's guest, uh, Dr. Abawi. That's not the purpose or the goal of this video at all, period. Right, however, they missed the mark because. The majority of people who are not taking the vaccine, it's not a matter of the vaccine itself or what's in the vaccine or what's not in it. It's a matter of trust and a long history of medical malfeasance with regards to vaccinations. Now, I do agree with them that there is a lot of fake, ridiculous, nonsensical uh, videos and memes and whatnot and just fake information regarding the vaccinations and Muslims are spreading this this stuff with zero regard for the truth or what is factual and this is this is embarrassing and blameworthy on top of that with no vetting at all you know a lot of just bro science and it's just just really stupid things. Let's be honest. They're right about that, 100%. They're right. There's a lot of nonsense out there. And both of them, we have to give them credit that they did their due diligence. And that's how you're supposed to approach things. You're supposed to approach things by doing your due diligence, asking the right people, reading the right information, and then spreading that. Due diligence is not spreading some sort of two-minute, three-minute uh, video clip of some random person on on Twitter or whatever, that's not, that's nothing. That's nonsense, right? So they're right about that. But especially Mufti Mink, because he lives in Africa, he has to understand why people will be hesitant for taking the vac vaccine. Both of them are South Asian. Mufti Mink does a lot of good work in Africa. But if you're living in Africa and you know, and you work with black Africans, and you know the history with Black Africa. You have to be a lot more cautious than that, with all due respect. This is Muthi Mink, and I hope this reaches him in, you know, respect and humility, and not not like, you know, and I'm not trying to come across as something so aggressive or anything like that. But anyways, when they were talking about the conspiracy theories and how some of them are absolutely ridiculous, and this is true, some of the more outlandish ones come directly as a result of Bill Gates. 
Now, the reason why I think that there's so much conspiracy theories, like ridiculous ones surrounding Bill Gates, because he's a eugenicist. Now, eugenics is pretty much the holy grail of white supremacy. Why? Because they can hide behind pretty much any science and blame it on overpopulation, which is exactly what they do. And you always know which countries are overpopulated because they're in Africa. <laughs> right? So even though the top 10 cities, the top 10 most overpopulated cities on earth, right? One of them is in Africa, which happens to be Cairo, which has no plans for depopulations in Cairo. None of the top 10 cities on earth have plans for depopulization. Only the African uh, cities do, right? And they hide behind like all these sciences. So you have too much pollution because you're overpopulated. You have too much infant childbirth because you're overpopulated. You have too much disease and poverty because you're over. All the world's problems are overpopulation and they wrap it as the world is overpopulated. But what they really mean is that we want to call the population of these black people. And they don't come out and say that you're more eugenicists. They come up as philanthropists, as, as people who care for the well-being of black Africans or dark-skinned South Asians. You understand? So Bill Gates is one of these people. And what ends up happening, and I could do a whole video on eugenics, like, but just for time's sake, right? If Bill Gates is one of these people, and Muslims now, after Allah tells you, yeah, Allah says that to you in the Quran, that all oh, you who believe, if there comes to you a fasik, with the news, then then verify it. You don't verify. You just quickly tweet, uh, hit send. You know, put it on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. You, like you're so quick to spread st lies. And even me, I'm tired of seeing all these videos and these ridiculous, crazy videos and memes and stuff like that. Thinking that you're doing, you're not doing anything. You're just spreading facade. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because you didn't take the time to vet any of this stuff. And so it takes people like Dr. Yasakati or uh, Mufti Mink to point that out, that you're spreading a whole bunch of nonsense. You see what I'm saying? That's why, that's why they take this position. Me, however, I take the opposite position. I don't want anybody to think that I'm like an anti-vaxxer. Right. But I'll give you an example of some of the ridiculous uh, conspiracy theories surrounding Bill Gates. Now, I remember when COVID first came out and there was a bunch of these conspiracy theories like COVID-19 is is 5G network and it's all all this kind of crazy stuff. And and, and anyway, one of the conspiracy theories that rolled out was that Bill Gates wanted three billion people to die. Right. So Associated Press. They fact checked this and they said Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates wants to eliminate at least 3 billion people in the world, starting in Africa in a plot involving back vaccines. AP's assessment, false. Gates never said this. The billionaire philanthropist has spoken about the benefits of slowing the rate of population growth, but has never advocated killing people. And this happens to be true. But what exactly did Bill Gates say? Uh, over 26 billion tons. Uh, for each American, it's about 20 tons. Uh, for people in poor countries, it's less than one ton. It's an average of about five tons for everyone on the planet. And somehow we have to make changes that will bring that down to zero. It's been constantly going up. It's only various economic changes that have even flattened it at all. So we have to go from rapidly rising to falling and falling all the way to zero. This equation has four factors, a little bit of multiplication. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, that you want to get to zero. And that's going to be based on the number of people, the services each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out uh, per unit of energy. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that's back from high school algebra. But let's, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got population. Let's look at each one of these 
and see how we can get this down to zero. Look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Now uh, that's back from high school algebra, but let's, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got population. Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. So, no, he did not say that we need 3 billion people to die. That's a lie. What he said that is the world population is trending towards 9 billion people. And if we do a good job with vaccinations, we can probably reduce that by 10 to 15 percent. 15 percent of 9 billion is 1.35 billion. Get your numbers and your facts straight. Another thing about Bill Gates is that he's really concerned about the children in Africa and about their well-being and the women and poverty and sickness and he has some ideas of how we could end poverty in Africa. Let's go to a couple questions that we've actually received since we started the, the webcast. Uh, the first is on population growth and the question is one of our most press pressing issues is population growth. How do you uh, expect this to be addressed? Well the population growth issue at the global level it's not that daunting. That is, the population percentage-wise is growing slower today than in the past, and so it will actually peak out. The problem is that the population is growing the fastest where people are less able to deal with it. So it's in the very poorest places that you're going to have a tripling in population by 2050. And so their ability to feed, educate, provide jobs, stability, protect the environment in those locations mean uh, you know, they're faced with an almost impossible problem. Northern Nigeria, Yemen, Chad. Uh, and so what we need to do is take this aid generosity and this innovation and go into those places, uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size. <laughs> Take this aid generosity and this innovation and go into those places, uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size. In recent weeks, we've told you about controversial billboards advertising meetings to discuss a plan set in motion 74 years ago to control the population of unwanted citizens, including African Americans. Mark Holmberg went to one of the meetings in the East End tonight. Here's his report and commentary. There can be little question that the Negro Project, started in 1939 by Margaret Sanger, changed the complexion of America. The Negro Project, as it has been labeled, was a strategic effort of socioeconomic cleansing. Some have labeled it scientific racism, the attempt to wipe out minority pockets of people. I think the ultimate goal was to slow down and to retard the uh, growth of blacks, the population of blacks uh, in America. Margaret Sanger, the godmother of Planned Parenthood, was the fearless voice for birth control a woman who thought charity weakened society. She was an early champion of gay rights, of women's rights, of abstinence and chastity. She believed diseases, mental illness and poverty could be eased by negative eugenics, trying to keep those inferiors from reproducing. Early on when it was, you know, illegal, of course, for abortion, then the emphasis was to uh, push strongly, um, you know, contraception. Uh, but then beyond that, the push began, began to be sterilization. It's a tough chapter of history where social engineers here and in Nazi Germany were joined by the science of eugenics. In essence, selectively breeding humans like we do farm animals and pets to get rid of the traits we don't want and promote the ones we do. Certainly within the black community, I mean, it's easy to look at census data and know that we are no longer the largest minority group uh, in this country. Um, and people could argue that that's an issue of immigration, but I think part of that is is that, you know, there are you know easily 17 you know million that are not here, and if those 
had children, uh, you know, how many more people would there be? This tough history has a modern message in the politics of abortion and reproductive rights. Low-income women of color are more likely to be pressured by doctors to use contraception than white women, even if it's not their preference. But this is nothing new. In the early 20th century, birth control gave women a newfound freedom over their bodies. But the reproductive rights movement was quickly co-opted by eugenicists who believed they could improve the country by lowering the birth rate of the so-called unfit. In other words, sterilizing poor women, women of color, and those with disabilities. Even Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, used eugenics to justify birth control. She thought society would be better if so-called unfit people had less babies, even if her intentions were good. Eventually, 32 states adopted mandatory sterilization laws. In the 1930s and 40s, North Carolina sterilized about 8,000 developmentally disabled people without their consent. Roughly 5,000 of them were black. By the 1970s, 70,000 people had been forcibly sterilized across the U.S., including one-third of women of childbearing age in Puerto Rico and nearly a quarter of Native American women, which caused some smaller tribes to face near extinction. In 1978, the government moved to limit the use of federal funds for sterilization, but coercive practices have continued. In the early 1990s, judges in several states gave women convicted of child abuse or drug use during pregnancy a choice. Use Norplant, a contraceptive inserted in the arm, or go to jail. And from 2006 to 2010, nearly 150 women were sterilized in two California state prisons, a quarter of them against their will. Even today, doctors are still more likely to tell low-income women of color to have fewer kids than middle-class white women. Uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Uh, and so what we need to do is take this aid generosity and this innovation and go into those places, uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size. 